We belong to Jesus. What a thought. What an honor. What a privilege. What a relief that we can say we belong to Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for us to make it possible for us to belong to you today. Oh God, today we just want to celebrate. We want to celebrate your goodness because you are a good, good God. You're always working on our behalf, always trying to help us with the issues that we face every day. Without us even knowing about it, without us understanding, and maybe even without us agreeing with what, we, with what you do, Father, we know that you have nothing but our best in mind. So we thank you, dear God. Just help us to surrender all, to submit completely, to surrender all our compartments of our lives to you and let you take full control because only you know what is best for us. Thank you, dear God. Yes, we belong to Jesus. Again, I say what a thought. Hallelujah. Father, we never get tired of hearing from your word because we are a people that love your words. Bless your children today, dear God. Bless them for their faithfulness. Bless them for their hunger for more of you. Satisfy them today, I pray. Today again, Spirit of the living God, I ask for your guidance and I ask for your anointing as I deliver this word. Because I am not the expert, but you are. So we take this opportunity again to take authority of any monitoring, tracking, blinding interfering, distracting, and deceiving spirits that might be present here today and would want to disrupt the service in any way whatsoever. We release you from your assignment and we cast you out of our midst here today. You are not welcome. Only God's angels are allowed to operate here this morning and minister to the heirs of salvation here today. Thank you, dear God. So today, dear God, help us to focus and to receive as we continue to learn about our enemy and how to deal with him effectively. Father, we do not fear the devil, but we understand that he poses a threat to not just our own well-being and our own destinies, but to those in our care, dear God. So help us today. Give us discernment, we pray, to know when the devil is responsible for our problems, and when we are responsible for our own troubles. Thank you for the strategies for dealing with the devil. And give us the boldness and the wisdom to follow through with those strategies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, dear God. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Because He is a good, good God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. God bless your good hearts. My goodness, we're going to need a bigger church soon at this rate. Thank God for lockdown restrictions. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have a problem, I think. <laughs> Sometimes things help us in funny ways. Okay, so today we're going to continue the discussion on our enemy. Last week, we started this discussion. We discussed last week... Um, the devil and where he comes from and the kingdom of darkness and what they're up to and how they attack us and why they attack us and all of those things. How many of you remember that message? Those of you who were here. Today we're going to focus specifically on how to deal with the devil. How to deal with the devil. How to deal with the devil. So, how are we supposed to deal with the devil? What should we do to defend ourselves when he attacks us? And how should we live so that it does not attack us so much? If our lifestyles make it difficult for the devil to attack us, then we, we wouldn't have to defend ourselves so much. Sometimes we bring trouble upon ourselves because we play with the devil. We cannot send the devil to hell. We discussed it last week, right? So if you think that was a solution to the problem, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not that simple. We have no authority to do so. Yes, both he and demons will go to hell one day, permanently, but that is still in the future, and only God has the authority to do so. In the meantime, Satan and demons are here on the earth, and we have to deal with them. Now listen, you can't just take a neutral point, uh, point of view here and say, listen, I, I have nothing to do with these guys. 
They must just mind their own business. And I'll mind my own business. I'm just going to stay out of this fight. No, you can't do that. You might want them, you might want to not bother them, but unfortunately, they will keep bothering you for as long as you live. So we need to know how to deal with them. Can you say amen? Just want to make sure you're still all awake here. Another thing we need to understand is that we cannot deal with Satan permanently once and for all. Okay, you can't give him a knockout punch and say, that's it, I've dealt with him, I'm free for the rest of my life. Again, it does not work like that. He will keep coming at you. It is a lifelong struggle. Now remember, we're not just dealing with the devil himself. We are dealing with his network, his kingdom, all the demons that are out there. In fact, more often than not, when we speak of the devil, we are really just referring to his kingdom. His network, not the devil specifically. Do you understand that? Remember last week we, we covered that in some detail. So then, what is the appropriate course of action in dealing with the devil? The answer is in James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, verse 7. Are the lights flickering or something? What's going on? Is it the lights? Somewhere that, oh, well, they're probably going to sleep just now anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, James chapter 4, verse 7. Oh, is it up? There it is. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Everybody repeat after me. Submit, resist, flee. That's how it works. Easy, isn't it? Our strategy for dealing with the devil consists of two phases, and they must be in this order. First, you must submit to God. Secondly, you must resist the devil. Then the devil will flee from you. That is how it works, and it must be in that order. What does it mean to submit to God? Let's start there. It means to yield to His authority and will, to commit your life to Him and His control, and be willing to follow Him to the best of your ability and for the rest of your life. When we submit to God, we come under His umbrella of provision and protection. And we are authorized to operate in His power. Always like that one. We are authorized to operate in God's power. He gives you His power and He says, go and work on my behalf. You don't have to do these things in your own strength. Thank God for that. But when Satan lures you out of God's protection and tempts you in a certain area of your life and you give in, you will not be able to resist him in that area. Why? Because you haven't submitted to God in that area. Any area of your life you do not submit to God, Satan has a legal right to harass you in that area, and God cannot do anything about it because you have allowed it. To resist means to withstand, to strive against, or to oppose in some way. We will discuss resisting the devil a bit more uh, in detail, a bit more in a moment. Notice from James chapter, uh, seven verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, that God will not resist the devil for us. God will not resist the devil for us. Yes, God will ultimately destroy both the devil and demons, but in the meantime, He has given me and you the authority, the responsibility, and the means to resist him ourselves. We have to do it. Notice as well, notice as well that when we resist the devil, he will flee from us. That means he doesn't just stop what he's doing and casually walk away. No, no, he runs away from you as in terror. You see, that is the way it's supposed to be. He is supposed to be scared of you, not you be scared of him. For too many people give the devil far too much respect. He's not as big and scary as he is. And we'll discuss that in a moment as well. So, what are some of the tactics we can employ in resisting the devil? There are, I'm going to discuss five of them. Of course, there's many others, but I'm just going to start with these five tactics on how to resist the devil. Are you ready for this? Number one, put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Now, if you think you've, you know, all about these, about the armor of God, you need to pay attention here. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. <clears throat> Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy. There it is again. In the time of evil or whenever bad things happen to you, okay? That's a time of evil. It can be any time. Then after the battle, notice it's a battle. After the battle, you will, be, you will still be standing. We are soldiers in a battle. We are soldiers in a battle. That is what the Christian life is largely all about. Now, some Christians don't seem to understand that. They haven't really started fighting yet. They are still sitting on the sidelines watching life go by. Instead of living, they are just letting life happen to them. That is why they struggle so much in life and have so little victory. You see, you cannot have victories in life if you do not fight some battles. Battle scars equal victories. Can you show God some battle scars? Since we are in a war, we need to dress appropriately. Some Christians are trying to fight this war in their pajamas. Then they wonder why they are getting their butts kicked. We need to dress up like a soldier. In Bible days, this is what a soldier looked like. We need to put on armor. Armor is there for our protection. Notice that this armor is God's armor. It is not our armor. The armor represents God's power and authority made available to us to resist the devil. Notice that we are instructed to put on the armor. What does that mean? It means that we do not automatically wear the armor. We need to put it on. Putting on the armor involves a decision that we make, an action that we take. There's nothing passive about this. Notice as well that there's so much information in this passage. In order to stay fully protected, you need to put on every piece of the armor. If one piece of the armor is not on or not properly on, it means you have a vulnerability in that area of your life and Satan will attack you there. Now, how many of you put on the armor of God every morning before you go out to face your day? Nobody. Ah, oh, you're the sharp ones. Eh? You know there's a catch here. Eh? <laughs> Those people who put on the armor every morning, I mean, why, why would they do that? Do they take it off every night? Is that why they put it on every morning? Doesn't the devil attack us at night or what? Don't we need to fight at night? Or we only daytime fighters. Is the devil maybe only a daytime fighter? Maybe he takes off his armor every night as well. Maybe it's difficult to sleep with chunky armor on. Eh? I mean, you might rip the sheets. Is that why people put on the armor every morning? Because they take it off every night. Ah, there's something wrong with that thinking, right? We need to be ready at all times. That's the bottom line. Once you put on the armor, the plan is to keep it on. If you want to go through a faith building routine every morning, because some people do that, you know, they get up in the morning, they stand in front of the mirror and they say, okay, now I'm going to put on my armor. I take the, uh, the helmet of salvation and I put it on. God, are you watching? Devil, are you watching? I put on the helmet of salvation. I take up the sword of the spirit. I take up my shield. I put on my belt and I go through a routine like this to, to, to build up their faith. You know, if that works for you, by all means, please... <laughs> Don't let me stop you. But the point I'm trying to make is that you should not be putting on your armor every day. If you want to go through a faith-building routine like that, rather confess that your armor is still on instead of saying that you're putting it on. It needs to be on the whole time. Change your thinking, right? Mommy, you can go upstairs if that will help you. Thank you. Now, let's have a look at the different parts of the armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. The next one, there we go. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness, also known as the breastplate of righteousness. For shoes, 
put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the enemy, of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Wow, six items there. You see, in Bible days, this type of talk would have made sense because these were the pieces of armor that a Roman soldier was dressed in, ready for battle. When Paul wrote Ephesians, when he wrote all of this, he was actually a prisoner in Rome, and he was guarded by Roman soldiers. So he had an opportunity to study their armor up close and develop these spiritual analogies that we're discussing here this morning. Each piece of the armor represents a biblical principle that will help you in defeating, in defending against the attacks of the devil when applied in your life. These principles only work when you apply them. The Word of God only works when you apply it. There's nothing passive about these principles. They need to be worked at and put into action. Let's see what the different parts of the armor represent or what they mean. First one, belt of truth. Belt of truth. Compared to other more prominent parts of the armor, like the shield or the sword, the belt can seem to be insignificant, but it's interesting that Paul mentions that one first. And for good reasons. For the Roman soldier, the belt played a central and integrating role. The belt kept other pieces of the armor in place. It held the breastplate in place and had clips for supporting the sword and the shield. In battle, if a soldier lost his belt, he would be in serious trouble. A simple thing like the belt was that important. The belt represents truth. Your battle against Satan is all about resisting lies and deception. Nothing squashes deception like truth. If you know the truth and a and, and how to apply it, you will never be deceived. Remember last week we discussed at length the devil's strategy of deception. The only and complete source of truth concerning spiritual matters is the Bible, nothing else, the Word of God. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Your belt will be firmly on when you know the truth Meditate on it, speak it out, and are obedient to it, and apply it in every area of your life. That's what it means to have the belt of truth on. Are you grounded in truth is the question. Second one, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate made of various materials was a plate that covered the chest and protected vital organs like the heart and lungs. The breastplate is likened to righteousness. It is like righteousness in our analogy. Now, what is righteousness? Sometimes people think that this is a heavy doctrine, righteousness, such a long word. But it's actually quite simple. Righteousness is the condition of being in right relationship with God. That's all it is, really. According to 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, righteousness also includes doing what is right in the sight of God. So, righteousness is the quality of being right in God's eyes. Being righteous is about being acceptable and joined to God. Now, this is quite a change when we consider that in the past, we were actually enemies of God and rejected by Him and separated from Him. That might sound like a harsh word, but it's true. Before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. The Bible says so clearly. But also, unbelievers, whether they realize it or not, are actually followers of Satan, who is God's enemy. So by extension, they too are God's enemy.
the basis of this new righteous relationship between us and God is the fact that we have been delivered from the curse of sin. You see, to God, relationship is all about where you stand in relation to sin. Has sin been sought out in your life or not? Well, then you are in right standing with Him. Has sin not been sought out or not? Is sin still an issue in your life? Well, then that relationship is not good. It's as simple as that. Your righteousness is not based on anything you have done or can do. <clears throat> righteousness is a free gift that was purchased for you at the cross. Thank you, Jesus. The relationship between Jesus Christ and God the Father is a righteous one. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, God gives you Christ's righteousness. In other words, wait for this. In other words, we have the same quality of relationship with God that Jesus has. Wow, what a powerful statement that is. <laughs> you see, from a relationship point of view, when God sees you coming down the road, He doesn't see you. He sees Christ. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. So that is righteousness. But what does it mean to put on the breastplate of righteousness? It does not mean to put on or to get righteousness, because you already have it if you're a child of God. Rather, to have the breastplate of righteousness on and to keep it on is to be constantly mindful of, meditate on, and have total confidence in your right relationship with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. There it is on the side there. For God has made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The devil wants nothing better than to attack your relationship with God. So, he will bombard your mind with thoughts that bring into question the quality of God's relationship with you, trying to pull your breastplate off. That's what he's trying to do. He will say things like, God doesn't care about you. I mean, who do you think you are? God will never do this or that for you. You're not that important to God. Or he reminds you of your past mistakes, hoping that you will be overcome by feelings of guilt, shame, condemnation, and guilt. All about attacking your assurance of your relationship with God. All, that, all, that, all about attacking your mind, uh, uh, you know, attacking what you know about your re right relationship with God. The devil will constantly try to convince you that you are not worthy of this special relationship with God. And you know what is actually right this time? For a change is actually right. You see, we are not worthy. We are only in this position because of Christ. Thank you, dear God. If you remain fully convinced that you have the righteousness of Christ, your breastplate will stay firmly on and your heart will be protected from this line of deception. If you have a good relationship with God, God is with you. Therefore, nobody can be against you, not even the devil. Then it makes it so much easier to resist the devil because you know that heaven backs you up. Now, how many times have you heard or have you ever heard this thing being taught that there's no protection for the back. Because if you look at the, uh, at the different uh, pieces of the armor that are mentioned, it doesn't mention any, anything that protects the back. So you get the impression that um, uh, spiritually we need no protection for our back. And the reason why people say that's the case is because as Christians, we never turn around and run. We stay and fight. So we, therefore, we don't need protection for the back. But really... There, no, now, please, listen to me carefully. Listen to the full story. As far as the Roman soldiers were concerned, not to have any protection on the back would have been suicide. Okay? I mean, it's just stupid to go into battle with no protection on your back. Because when they got into the mix of things, there were just people all over each other. People were coming from behind you. 
They would love to stab your naked back. Even the devil would love to stab your naked back. So it's not true that there's no protection for the back. The breastplate was actually a two-piece plate, one that fit on the front and one that fit on the back and was clipped together down the sides here. So the breastplate is something that went all around the body to protect the body. They mention it as the breastplate, but it protected the back as well. So I don't ever believe the story that we don't need protection for the back because we are such brave people that we never turn around and face the enemy. We'll stay and fight him. No, that's just nonsense, okay? I used to believe that too. I don't anymore. Thank you, dear God. Right, third one, the gospel shoes. Now, as in those days, a soldier needed to advance into enemy territory. <clears throat> Along the way, the enemy would lay down traps and other dangerous obstacles. So good footwear was important to protect the soldier. Of course, nowadays they use landmines, right? And no boot is going <laughs> to help you against a landmine. But in those days, they would put sharp sticks in the ground and you know, ditches and animal traps and things like that just to... to, to to trap the soldiers and to injure the soldiers' uh, feet. The shoes represent a person's willingness and readiness to go and share the gospel. We know that God has given us all the responsibility to share the gospel. Jesus said that we should go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Back then, going meant walking so the soldiers needed good shoes now you might have seen in some pictures it looks like the, the roman soldiers had sandals on i don't know if you've ever seen pictures like that they had sandals on again that, that that's not true they might have used them for ceremonial purposes but when they were in in war uh, they had proper boots on okay boots in those days weren't boots like today but they didn't wear sandals you don't go into battle with sandals that's 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 what you put on after you shower that night before you go to bed but not to go to battle now, maybe some Christians do that. I don't know. But uh, Roman soldiers weren't that dwarf. They put on proper boots when they went into battle. The thinking here is that you will have to go into Satan's territory to share the gospel and rescue the lost because that is where they are in Satan's territory. Satan is going to, Satan is going to try to trip you up along the way, which is why you need good shoes so that you can keep standing and keep walking. Like Johnny Walker, right? In ancient times, a soldier's footwear would have studs underneath, spikes underneath, so that while fighting, he could stand firm, not lose his, not lose his grip, and not slip or lose his balance. In battle, if a soldier fell to the ground, he would be in serious trouble. That would be the end of him if he fell to the ground. So it was important he could keep standing. That is where the devil wants you on the ground where he can kick you and trample all over you but you are not going to let him because if you are ready at any time to go and share the good news with somebody you have got your shoes firmly on and you will be able to stand your ground when the devil attacks that's what it means to have your gospel shoes on now i don't understand how that works exactly but that is the principle if you are willing to go and share the gospel with people. If you are equipped at any time to go and share the gospel with people, just that alone seems to offer you protection from the attacks of the enemy. And you will be able to resist him. That's how the principle works. Fourth one, shield of faith. The shield of faith. There's so much happening here with the shield of faith. I'm actually blown away by how many points there are on the shield of faith. The Roman shields at the time were large and would cover the soldier completely. In fact, each shield was tailor-made for each specific uh, soldier. So it, they were as, as tall as the, as the soldier was and as wide as the soldier was. They were made specific for each uh, uh, soldier. The shields were made from wood and they were covered in the front with leather or animal hide. In the armor of God, the shield represents faith. However, a shield is only effective in battle when it is up and in the correct position. If the shield is lying on the ground, it is of no use. You see, 
There's a difference between having faith and using faith. Faith by itself does nothing for you. Faith needs to be exercised. It needs to be put into action. The King James Version of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, and the reason why I refer to the King James Version, you know, the one with all the D's and the D's, that is still the most accurate of all the English translations. Accurate in terms of how it, it, it lines up with the original Greek from which we get our English translations. But that version says that above all, above all, taking the shield of faith. This indicates that faith is the most important part of your armor. That's what it means. In fact, without faith, none of the other pieces of the armor would work. Both Old and New Testament state that the just shall live by faith. We know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to accomplish anything in the kingdom of God. In fact, faith is like the currency of the kingdom of God. If you want anything, you must first pay for it with faith. In spiritual warfare, a strong faith is vital, just like a strong shield. Because the shield was made of natural materials, with time, it would begin to dry and crack. A cracked shield was ineffective, as you can imagine. So shields needed to be maintained to keep them in good working order. Your faith, too, needs to be maintained to keep it in good working order. If you neglect your faith, it will crack and fall to pieces. Maintaining and growing strong faith requires constant work. To maintain his shield, each soldier carried a vial of olive oil with him. He carried a small bottle of olive oil with him. Olive oil. Can you see where this is going? First, the entire shield would be dipped in water. Then, olive oil would be rubbed into the wood of the shield. This process would keep the shield pliable, flexible, so it wouldn't crack. In Scripture, olive oil represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing is a yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God operating in a, in a believer. The anointing empowers you to press on. You need the anointing to be effective in spiritual battle. What about the water? Because remember they dipped the shield in water. What about the water? In scripture, water represents the word of God. Dipping the shield in water was part of the process of keeping the shield strong. Isn't it by the word of God that we grow strong faith? After all, doesn't the belt, which represents the truth of the word of God, contain a clip that supports the shield that represents faith. Regarding the shield, there's another thing that water does. <clears throat> because the enemy would often shoot flaming arrows at them, <clears throat> the Roman soldiers would wet the leather in front of the shields just before battle. It made the shield a bit heavier, but it was worth it. So any flaming arrow shot into the shield would be extinguished by the wet leather. Those guys weren't that stupid, eh? The flaming arrows represent the thoughts of doubt and deception shot by Satan into your mind. That's what those flaming arrows represent in the spirit. The wet shield represents our faith, strengthened by the truth of God's word, which is what the water stands for, which protects us from the deception of the enemy. Can you see how in different ways and on so many different levels, as water strengthens and protects the shield, so the word of God builds strong faith. The analogy is perfect. It's beautiful. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. The shield wasn't just a defensive piece of armor. 
Yes, it was mainly a defensive piece of armor, but it was also used in an, effect, in, in an offensive way. The shield had a metal boss. It had like a, a, a bronze knob on the front of it in the middle. And that was designed to hit the enemy, to push him back, and with any luck actually push him to the ground. Then the Roman soldier could finish the job off with his sword. Your faith is not just there to protect you when the enemy attacks. You will need faith to go on the offensive too. Because even your main offensive weapon, the, your sword, cannot work without faith. The Word of God does not work without faith. Ask the sons of Sceva. They tried to do that and got their naked butts kicked. Some of you don't know the story. Okay, go and read it. It's in Acts. There is another thing that Roman soldiers did with their shields. They would stand together in rows. The soldiers in the front row would hold, hold their shields in front, and then the ones in, in, the, in the rows behind would hold their shields above them. So the entire block of soldiers would be protected by shields in front and on top. <clears throat> Each soldier benefited from not just his own shield, but from the shields of those around him. <clears throat> we are talking about standing in unity here. Yes, there may be times when you have to fight alone, but that's not ideal. If you are humble, honest, and transparent, you can share your struggles with those you can trust. Then, as they cover you in prayer and stand in agreement with you, you will benefit from their faith too. There's another thing that they did when they were standing in this block with, with shields all around them, which was like a defensive posture. What they would do is they would take new recruits, soldiers who don't have experience yet, and put them in the middle of that block, surrounded by the experienced soldiers outside first. What is that telling us? It's telling us that young Christians, those who are not stable in faith yet, when they go through challenges, we cover them with our faith. We put them in the middle and protect them until they are strong enough to stand on their faith. And then we move them to the outside where they can fight their own challenges. And then the next lot of youngsters or new Christians, we put them in the middle as well and protect them with our faith until they develop and move them out. So many wonderful analogies with this uh, shield story. Collective faith is a powerful thing. Hallelujah. Thank you, dear God. Fifth one, helmet of salvation. Are you getting something or not? <clears throat> Are you guys awake or not? Or? Okay. The helmet of salvation. What is that all about? <clears throat> the obvious value of the helmet is to protect a soldier's head against blows to the head. In battle, protecting the head is vital, especially when they fought with, with uh, the stuff that they fought with back then. A soldier can survive a broken arm or a broken leg, but just about any blow to the head can be fatal. So that it's important that you protect the head. The head is a very vital part of the body. It houses the brain and the critical senses of sight and hearing. To maintain quality of life, and life itself, these organs need to be protected. That is what the helmet does. It is also in the head that we find the mind and the faculties of imagination, knowledge, and intellect. Protecting these entities from the wrong input will go a long way to ensure spiritual health and even salvation itself. That is what putting on the helmet of salvation does. Putting on the helmet of salvation is not about getting salvation because you're already saved. So you've already got salvation. So putting on the helmet of salvation is not about getting saved, but about maintaining salvation. Salvation is the most valuable asset that you possess. Nothing is worth pursuing more when you don't have it, and nothing is worth preserving more when you do have it. To preserve salvation... You need to keep your helmet of salvation properly on. If your helmet of salvation is not properly on, or not on at all, things which are contrary to the Word of God will be able to get into your mind through your eyes and ears, threatening your spiritual well-being and maybe even your 
salvation. You see, it's all about maintaining what you know about the assurance of salvation and keeping anything that wants to threaten that, that, that assurance, bring doubt about your salvation. That's what having the helmet of salvation is on. Since the battlefield is in the mind, renewing of your mind and protecting your thought life is a big part of keeping your helmet of salvation on. When your helmet of salvation is on, you will be fully persuaded of the assurance of salvation. The helmet protects the mind from attacks on the assurance of salvation. The last thing you want to doubt is your salvation. The assurance of salvation is the ultimate motiv motivation for resisting the devil. Don't let him pull your helmet off. You are a child of God. You have assurance of salvation. And don't let anything bring doubt to your mind about where you stand as far as salvation is concerned. Keep that helmet firmly on. Six one, sword of the spirit. Sword of the spirit. That's the last one. That's, that kid is so good, eh? If you ever had enough of him, we'll take him from you, really. The sword is the main offensive part of the armor. It represents the word of God, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Is that one on? Oh, there it is on the side. <clears throat> For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, and I'll stop there. We can, see from, we can see from this how the Word of God is likened to a sword. The Word of God is like a sword in battle. How is the Word of God used as a weapon, as a sword? You use the Word as a weapon when you speak it out of your mouth against your enemy and against bad circumstances, and you speak it in faith. Jesus showed us how when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Three times Jesus resisted the devil's temptation by quoting the word of God to the devil. When the devil tempted him to turn the stones into bread, this is how Jesus responded. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yeah, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. That uh, Jesus threw the word of God at the devil. That's how you use it, as a weapon. You can do the same thing. When sickness symptoms start to appear, you can declare that you have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. You speak it out aloud. Let Satan hear it. When Satan tries to get you to think that God does not care because you are going through a difficult time, you respond by telling him that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called to his purposes. So you're not scared of bad times. When Satan tries to remind you of your sinful past, you tell him that you have confessed your sins and God has forgiven you. Respond, speak it out, use the word of God. Speak the word of God at situations, at bad circumstances. How many of you remember that message on speak to your mountain? <clears throat> of course, you cannot use the word of God if you do not know it. Also, you need to be obedient to it, otherwise you are not authorized to use it you cannot use any part of the word of god that you're not obedient to it you have no authority to use it the devil will just laugh at you so keep your sword sharp by studying and knowing the word of god and being ready to use it at all times thank you dear god Okay, so that is, the, that is the armor of God. That's the first strategy in dealing with the devil. Remember I told you there were five of them. The first one is the armor of God that we've just dealt with. Okay, number two. Disentangle yourself from the world. 
disentangle yourself from the word. And that's such a beautiful word, disentangle yourself from the world. The Bible makes it clear that we do not belong to the world. Now, we belong to planet Earth. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this world system, this humanistic world system. We as Christians, as Christians, as children of God, do not belong to this world system. So we are not to love this world. And we are to separate ourselves from the world. We cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. You can't do that. Like Pastel often says, it's not like the, the ocean baskets. You, you can't have half chips and half rice. It's either full chips or full rice. <laughs> Basically, what we are saying here is that once you are in Christ and have committed to following Him, you cannot continue to live and behave like unbelievers. God has set us apart to pursue a holy lifestyle. Now, it is not so much about resisting the devil as it is about staying out of his way. If you play on the devil's playground, he is going to play with you. If you behave in worldly ways that lead to sin, you create what we call open doors in your life, which are legal avenues that the devil can use to bring trouble upon yourself. You know, soon after we started this church, we used to have a youth meeting on a Friday night. Back then, we had enough youth to, to have a meeting like that. And there were some youth who used to come, not every time, they used to come like every second time, they used to come to the, the youth meeting here. And then every other Friday, they used to go to the nightclub uh, across the highway over here. I mean, can you remember that, that lot? They didn't last long. I'm not surprised. I mean, you, you, you can't behave like that. They obviously didn't understand that uh, you cannot play with the world and be in the kingdom of, 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 of God as well. It does not work like that. You're either in or you're out. This picture here, I mean, isn't this dude so cool? Did you check out his thumb? Look, he's got a thumb ring. Hey, how cool is that dude? And the chick is just digging, mate. Eh? I mean, that's just the way to be. But you know what this picture, what came to my mind when I first saw this picture? It reminds me of God's goodness and mercy towards me. Even before I was saved, even when I was still in the world. You know, I, I grew up in a free state. And that's not my fault, so, so don't take it out on me. But... Uh, the first time I came to Joburg was when I came to study at, at, at Wits University at the age of, of 18. Now, you know what it's like at Vosti, uh, well, back then anyway, I don't know about these days, but there's, there's a, a big party culture. You know, everybody's just jolling the whole time. Um, so me, I, I was a bit of a nerd where I came from, so I, I battled to fit in with, with, with the crowd, you know. So I thought, I better shape myself up. I better come right, you know. One of the things I, I you know, there's a, there's a lot of partying, a lot of, a lot of nightclubbing, and a lot of drinking. And I, I never did any of those things. So I was real green at that. So I thought, you know what, I better, I better, I better come right here. So I tried to force myself to, to drink. And the, and the harder I tried, the, the, I mean, the stuff just tasted bad. I mean, I don't mind the occasional beer and, and a bit of wine and things like this, but to drink some of the heavier stuff and, and to the extent that that party people do, you know, I just could never do that. I couldn't do that. The same thing with going to clubs. I remember once standing there on, on, on next to the dance floor, watching these people jumping up and down, saying to myself, now, how is that a good time? Why is that the right thing to do? And you know, when I was in first year, I, I had a car, and not, not many students in first year have a car. So whenever friends of mine wanted to go jawling, they would take me with because I was the driver, you know. So they, they would pay for me to get in and out of this place. They would even organize dates for me. I just had to pitch up with my car and off we go. So we went to this nightclub in Joburg once, me, this other guy, and, and this blind date that they organized for me, and blind is the word. Um, so there we were on the dance floor jumping up and down, and I'm saying to myself, what the hell am I doing here? So I thought, you know what, I better, I better, I better, you know, do this right. So I offered the lady a drink. Now, well, what, what would you, because I had a bar there. So I said, what would you like to drink? So she said, she, she said, I'll have a Sanzano, thanks. So I thought, what the heck is that? I've never heard of a Sanzano. So I walk up to the bar, bar counter and I said to the barman, 
Two Sanzanas, please. I thought, you know what? She probably knows what she's talking about. I better take one as well. So I said, two Sanzanas, please. And he said, black or white? So I thought, what? Do these things come in different colors too? So I said, black. I was hoping she wouldn't know the difference. So off I go and I give her this, this thing. But you know what? It was soon after that I realized, you know, these guys are just abusing me. Just because i got a car, they're just abusing me. And you know what? Even as an 18-year-old unsaved guy back then, I had enough common sense. And I think the Lord just injected some godly wisdom into me. Because at one point, I actually came to the conclusion that I'm right and everybody else has to be wrong. You know, normally it's the other way around. The majority is right, and if you're the odd one out there, there must be something wrong with you. But I actually, you know, it's just a dose of godly wisdom that came upon me. And I actually came to the conclusion, I'm not going to try this stuff anymore. I'm okay, and there's something wrong with all of you. And I stopped doing all of that, and thank God for that. Because who knows where, you know, things can go if you, if you get, 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 go with the wrong crowds and get into drinking and all sorts of things. Thank you, dear Lord. Yeah. Now, us older folks might not go to nightclubs, but maybe we engage in other worldly activities. Watch how you behave at work parties. Watch what you watch on TV. What sort of people do you keep company with? Do you also partake in the negative and fearful speech that comes out of unbelievers? What about gossiping? Are you an example at work, or do you also take shortcuts? At the copying machine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do people abuse the copying machine or what? Sometimes I used to see people printing books there. Books. Private stuff. Very bad. Do you live within your means? Yeah, some of you are feeling guilty right now, eh? <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm not finished. Do you live above your means? Do you cheat on tax? Do you obey traffic rules? (laughs) Have you disentangled yourself from the world? Sometimes we forget what a high standard God expects from us when we are in Christ. God has called us to be the example to unbelievers. If you live like them, you will not be able to resist the devil because then you are not in submission to God. Number three, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Have you noticed how the devil's attacks and your resisting of him is nothing but a bunch of mind games? (laughs) It's all just a bunch of mind games, all of this. The battlefield is indeed the mind. Our defense is not just about managing our thought life, but about adopting the right mindset too. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. There it is. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? When we come to Christ, we come with a, a lot of bad programming from the world. All that stinking thinking needs to be removed. Like all the drinking and the pot and all that sort of stuff. Taking off your ring, off your thumb. What happens if we get stuck and you can't get it past the knuckle anymore? Then what? That's not the finger to put a ring. Is a guy nuts or what? Hey, but the chick is digging, so who cares? Brainwash is not always a bad thing. And that is exactly what happens when you come to church and read your Bible. Your brain gets washed by the Word of God. Brainwashing is not a bad thing. It can be a good thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, in other words, not natural, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. (laughs) 
Wow. Can you see the battle in the mind all over this scripture? Mind games, mind games. A stronghold is an embedded thought pattern or value that is contrary to the word of God. It is an area of wrong thinking in our minds and demons rule from these spaces. Demons take advantage of wrong knowledge. That is why it's important that we know the truth. It is important that we manage our thought life because thoughts can either lead to actions or keep you in bondage through inaction. You need to think about what you are thinking about. God gives us the responsibility of managing our own thought life. And you need to be, you need to be disciplined about it because everything starts here. Your mind is renewed when you think like Christ does. Since the battlefield is in the mind, if yours is renewed, the devil cannot operate there. Now, I know it's a process. We get there slowly but surely, right? It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. But the more you expose yourself to the Word of God and to the things of God and start to think like that, instead of thinking the way you used to think when you're still in the world, the more you start to line up like thinking like Christ does, and the less the devil will be able to use your own mind against you. Number four, resist fear and worry. Resist fear and worry. Now, a few weeks ago, we spoke at great length about uh, resisting fear. So I'm not going to go through everything again, but uh, putting people in fear, making people fear anxiety and worry, constant worry, is a big area where Satan attacks people. Fear, fear, fear. Faith and fear are opposing forces that cannot coexist. How many of you remember the two dogs at each other's throats? The more faith you have, the less room there will be for fear in your life. And of course, the other way around, the more fear you have, the less room there will be for faith. Fear, which includes things like worry and anxiety, is a tactic of the devil to rob you of joy, torment you, make you give up, and distract you from God's purposes for your life. Distract you from God's destiny. That's the main purpose of fear. To stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Now, here are some specific things you can do to defeat fear. Firstly, feed your faith. That's by hearing, studying, and meditating on God's Word, because that's where faith comes from. We all know that, right? Number two, starve your fears. Take control over what comes in through your eyes and ears into your mind. <clears throat> don't, don't hang around negative people who always speak negative over situations, causing fear to rise up in you. Don't propagate negative news. All you're doing is spreading fear. If they don't need to know about it, then don't tell them. If it is true, just pray about it. God did not tell us to complain, but to pray when bad things happen. Watch the news so you can be informed. But remember that the world is run by the devil. And news is predominantly negative. So don't let fear take root. Don't take bad news to heart. Thirdly, Trust God's love. Love is a force that drives out fear. <clears throat> Believe it or not. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, I know, that, I know that's a mouthful, but we'll chew it slowly in a moment. This is an amazing scripture. Who would have thought that there's a link between love and fear? So what does all of this mean? All love originates from God. When we love others, it is because God loved us first. If we trust in God's love, it will drive out fear because 
God's love for us will motivate him to respond to our concerns. Our love, our love for others is proof that love for us. He, oh, sorry, let me try it again. Our love for others is proof of that love for us that drives out fear. Fourthly, speak out against fear. When the devil attacks with fear, rebuke him loudly and boldly and don't wait until fear gets bad. Just do it immediately. No devil, there is a lie. I will not believe it. Fear, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. That alone will make the fearful thought leave. Remember, you act immediately, the thought enters your mind. Then declare God's promises over that situation to seal that victory. <clears throat> Fifthly, pray in the Spirit. If you find yourself in a persistent fear battle, bring the matter before the Father and pray in the Spirit regularly about it. It will strengthen your inner man and bring supernatural peace. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. <clears throat> pray is a very effective way of resisting fear and worry. We just need to pray more. Right, number five. <clears throat> Resist temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. Thank you, God. You will not allow the temptation to you will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. It is important to note that when you are tempted, you are always in control. There's nothing supernatural about temptation. It is nothing but a simple trap. That's all it is. You do not have to give in. God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. You can never blame the devil when you sin like Eve did. Yes, Satan will tempt you, but he can't force you to sin. You, you have a free will. If you give in and sin, you and you alone are responsible for that sin. You cannot blame the devil. Like people sometimes say, oh, the devil made me do it. They use that in court quite often. When a judge says, why did you do that? Oh, the devil made me do that. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. The devil is not a legal entity in this world that we live in, and you can't blame him anyway. The reason why God holds us responsible for our sin is because at some point we cross over from temptation by the devil to a decision taken by us to act. At that point, it is no longer about the devil but about us. Because the consequences of sin can be so dire, we need to be sharp and quick in dealing with temptation. Do not entertain temptation. We need to run from what is wrong. We need to run from what is wrong and choose to do what is right. Running from a tempting situation is your first step to victory. That is exactly what Joseph did. You are sleeping, madam. That is exactly what Joseph did. When Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, he ran. Yes, he left his clothes behind, but he ran. He didn't try to reason with her. He got out of the situation and disappeared. And you know what? When it comes to sexual temptation, that's the only way to deal with it. Immediately, you run. You duck. If you stick around too long, it reaches a point where you will not be able to resist. And never mind how tough you think you are. When a tempting thought enters your mind, you must reject it immediately like he did. The battle against temptation is an ongoing one. 
But like all other battles in life, you do not you do not have to fight this one on your own. Rely on the Holy Spirit to help you, especially if you are vulnerable to sin in a specific area. We all have our weaknesses, right? Ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of Scripture to counteract that specific temptation. The Word of God remains your best defense against temptation. Right, now let's talk about how big is your enemy? How big is your enemy? How big is your enemy? Oh, that guy's got a big devil on him. Some people think, some people seem to be forever dealing with a big devil. The devil has been on my case all day, is something we often hear. And of course, some people would not have it any other way. They're always trying to impress you with their ongoing problems. Some people have got such big problems that their problems have got problems. And they're so proud of that. So my question is, how big is the devil really? We started with a bullfighting story last week. We will finish with a bullfighting story this week. In a fair fight with no weapons, no trickery, and no red caps, like I said last week, the bull will win the battle every time against that man. He stands no chance. Why? Because the bull is much bigger. That's why. Sometimes size does matter. You know, in the animal kingdom, it's all about size. Eh? Size and numbers, but mainly size. No sardine in his right mind would think about tackling a whale. The guy knows he's outsized. What about you? What about you sitting here? How big are you compared to the devil you face every day? Is the devil really that big and scary? Like a lot of people believe. The devil will always try to make himself look bigger than he actually is. He will always try to make you believe that the problems that you face are worse than they actually are. But it's all just one big bluff. These guys are devil wannabes. This cat and rooster are not as big as they look. It's all deception. The devil isn't as big as he wants you to believe either. You see, animals do that in the animal kingdom. When they are threatened by somebody, they puff themselves up. But it's just hair sticking out there. If you touch the cat on the top there, you will feel that for the first five centimeters, there's nothing there. You can push all the way down until you feel cat. It's just one big lie. And the devil does that. He puffs himself out to make it look like he is bigger than you. <sighs> now, where was I? I mustn't distract myself like this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Part of it. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. How many times have we heard that one? When I look at some of you, you look a bit small. You look a bit, a bit skinny. And of course, they've got a very nice description. You're like a bicky, you're like a bicky, you're like a lach in the brook. Have you ever heard that one? You're like, you're like lach in the brook. You know, when I look in your pants, I don't see much. Ugh, you're a bit skinny, dude. Should we be worried about the small people in our area, around us? We've been talking a lot about size, but it's not really about size, is it? No, not physical size. Physical size is just an analogy of the point I'm trying to get across now. We are dealing here with a spiritual matter, not a physical one. You see, it is possible to be bigger on the inside than on the outside. The Bible tells us that God lives inside us. If you're in Christ, God lives inside you, right? Don't ever ask God, where are you? He's in you, dummy. What kind of question is that? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, tells us that God is greater than the devil. You see, the comparison is never between you and the devil, but between the God in you and the devil. That's where the comparison is. It is the size of God in you that really matters. How much of God have you allowed into you? That's the question. David knew that, that it wasn't about his size when he went out to face Goliath. David knew it wasn't about size. 
Goliath thought it was about size. Before David went out to fight Goliath, King Saul offered him his armor. But David refused to take it. You see, David already had armor. He had God's armor and he knew it. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. He said, Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Snakes and scorpions here refer to evil spirits. That was, that's what it's talking about. Now, don't go out there and walk on real snakes and scorpions. That's not what this is saying, right? It's talking about demons. Jesus said, Jesus said that he has given us authority over the power of the devil. That means that he has officially given us control over the power of the enemy. So, you decide how much power he has. We have all that it takes to deal with the enemy, the devil. So, after all is said and done, compared to you, how big is the devil really? Compared to you, how big is the devil really? Well, folks, that is entirely up to you. You see, the devil can be as big as you allow him to be, or he can be as small as you make him. It is entirely up to you. Jesus has given us authority over him. God has asked us to, God has instructed us to fight the devil on, on his, uh, or, well, he's, he's not going to fight on our behalf. We have to do it. And it is entirely up to us how big the devil is in our life. In summary, can I quickly summarize a few things here? Satan does not rule us. If we submit to God, we have the authority and the power to resist the devil. God's not going to do it for us. We must do it. Resisting the devil is all about confronting deception with the truth of the Word of God. Truth needs to be the basis of our belief system. Don't believe nonsense. Because it is out of that system with a renewed mind that we act. By managing our thought life, filtering what we see and hear, watching our lifestyles and resisting sin, we put ourselves in a very strong position to resist the devil in our lives. You have the authority to put the devil in his place. So use it. The problem is Christians do not do it enough. We are far too meek and mild. We are just not aggressive enough in dealing with the devil when we need to do so appropriately. Thank you, dear God. Did you enjoy this word today? Give the Lord a hand of praise if you enjoyed that word. Thank you, dear God. Let me close in prayer. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dear God, for this word. Father, we are not ignorant of the devil's schemes, and we are very familiar, very well acquainted with your word.